Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlen, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today, we're here to talk about some survey results from a Tripwire-sponsored survey around cloud security. Uh, to have that conversation, I'm joined by two folks. Uh, first, Stephen Wood who is a strategic product manager at Tripwire, and also Brent Holder, who is a technical product manager at Tripwire. Welcome both Stephen and Brent. Good morning. Hello, thanks for having me. So the way we're going to proceed through this conversation, um, I've asked Stephen and Brent to pick out a couple of the metrics or the results from the survey that they thought were most interesting. And all of the survey results um, are available from Tripwire, so you can go to tripwire.com. Uh, find the survey. There's a blog post about it. There's a link to um, a PDF of just the results. Uh, but we're going to pick and choose the things that we thought were interesting for this conversation. Um, I'll start off with just a little bit of the, the demographics information to, to set the stage for, for what's included here. Um, we surveyed uh, 310 uh, individuals who are responsible for cloud security. Um, at a variety of uh, organization uh, organizations, and those organizations look like this. Um, the majority of them were from North America, or the Americas rather, 78%, um, 18% from the Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, pretty good distribution in terms of job level. So um, 46% were categorized as a team manager, 22% as an executive, 32% as an individual contributor. So in terms of distribution, we, we do have perspective sort of across the spectrum there. And then company size, um, we did a, a cutoff around um, at a, a hundred uh, employees or more. Um, and in this case, forty-one uh, percent were a thousand to five thousand employees. Forty-three percent were more than five thousand employees, um, and sixteen percent were the one hundred to a thousand employee category. So, um, pretty good split around company size, uh, around geography, around role. Um, so based on those demographics, I think from this survey, we've got a pretty good selection of results to talk about. And with that, I want to dig into some of the, the results that we thought were most interesting. And I'm going to start with a couple of results that, that Stephen picked out. Um, the first, which actually just uh, is, is more context, if you will, it's not security specific. The first was around the number of cloud vendors or the market share of those cloud vendors. So this was uh, from our survey results. Um, we gathered that 36% um, of the respondents said they had one cloud vendor, 42% said they had two, 18% uh, said they had three. Uh, and then the distribution here was interesting because 80% selected that they had Microsoft Azure, 66% said they had AWS, 28% Google Cloud Platform, and then there were some stragglers at the bottom from other companies. So, Stephen, why did you pick out this particular metric? What did you think was interesting about it? Well, one of the things I like to look for are anomalies, things that surprise me. Uh, and uh, some of the distribution associated with this uh, uh, suggested that uh, 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 Microsoft had been making a come-from-behind play and and I've been doing some checking on that one just to, you know, validate the uh, the data a bit. And I think that, you know, other data suggests that uh, the balance is a little different, that uh, uh, AWS is about 33%, and then if you divide down by half, uh, you get uh, 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 Microsoft and divide down half again, and you get Google. And that was more the distribution. So, let me, so let me make sure I understand what you're saying, because I, I think what you're saying is that in the market research you've done, AWS is the market leader with 33% of the market. Is that the way I should interpret that? 33% approximately for mm -hmm. AWS, about 16% for uh, Microsoft, and about 8% approximately for Google. And that'll vary a little bit, uh, you know, plus or minus a couple of points. Sure. But that seems to be the consensus from, you know, like three or four other players. So and I so wonder, does that... Uh, because we're talking about an environment that that's fundamentally multi-cloud, does that mean that 
that I'm trying to figure out how to interpret that because the 33% for AWS, do those, do, does that market data include the organizations having multiple vendors or not? Do you know no, what I mean? no. That, that one's just, you know, flat market share. Oh, yeah, um, dollars. Yeah. Uh, uh, that would probably be the best way to look at, uh, you know, the way that data is, is cut. This, uh, this is specifically about, uh, multi vendor. Um, but I would be hard pressed to, to really say that, uh, Azure has a unique, uh, uh, concentration of multi vendor, uh, uh, multi cloud, uh, uh, players in its community. So I'd be a little bit surprised if that were, uh, uh, not a little bit anomalous in the data. Interesting. I mean, we of course weren't asking about how much money, how much budget they're spending. Cause what, what I took away from this was that Azure is, uh, you know, if you if you look at the the blend of of organizations that have one, two, or three uh, cloud vendors, that more of them, eighty percent of them, check the box for Azure, which would seem to me that that Azure makes a really strong second um, second choice. You know, for a, your cloud vendor. I mean, it's, it's not out of the question, but, you know, just let me give you another data point. And yeah, that is that, uh, 82, uh, I, and don't ask me where the source of this is. Uh, but, uh, uh, I've been coming up with information that said that 82% of, uh, enterprises have a multi-cloud strategy. Yep. Uh, so you would expect with that kind of, uh, 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 a relatively ubiquitous, uh, belief in multi-cloud that it would be reflected among all the vendors that are present there. Um, you know, so I would also say that uh, you can almost guarantee that anybody who's using Google at all has a multi-cloud strategy. Yeah. So you would expect to see them to be asymmetrically represented as well, uh, but that wasn't really the case. Yeah. So my suspicion it's it's more of a sampling question that uh, it may be a group that uh, just has a, a a tighter affinity to uh, uh, Microsoft. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, I see why you saw that. Why you thought that was an interesting outcome there. So well, something that I was kind of thinking about um, related to the distribution that we saw here, and I think this kind of goes back to what you were saying, Tim, about the market share versus the number of users. Um, if you ask someone, you know, do you use Office 365 or do you use Google, um, they might say that they use both, but they might only use like slides from Google and a ton of software from uh, Office 365 or vice versa. Oh, uh, yeah. And, you can't really tell to what degree people are, you know, committed to each of the uh, vendors just by asking. Well, yeah. If they so use if you them. if you roll like Office three sixty five into that into that, you could you could justify the Azure numbers. Although it says Azure, but you know, people sometimes are confused. I suppose. Well, uh, so let's let's move on and let's talk a little bit about some of the actual security oriented results here. Um, Brent, you picked out one of the the results around. Uh, the question was, how does your company assess overall cloud security posture? And the responses were, you know, fully automated, partially automated, manual, or we don't assess at all. Um, and you thought that was an interesting result. What, what was interesting about that result for you? So, um, I think the most interesting thing was the, the less automated quarter of the results. We had 22% of organizations that say they handle it manually. Um, and then 2% who say they don't assess it at all whatsoever. Which sounds like a an interesting situation to be in, to say the least. But uh, that's you know a quarter of the respondents who don't have any that's automation. The YOLO crowd. <laughs> What's that? That's the YOLO crowd. Yeah, um, <laughs> probably literally. Uh, but yeah, uh, just thinking about what it would take to manually check some of these things. Um, well, I mean. The other, the other result in there was 70% said, the vast majority, 70% said it's partially automated. And I, I couldn't help thinking that partially automated leaves an awful lot of room for, uh, manual or not assessed. Um, if you go look at the numbers where you, where we got a little more specificity in there and we said, do you automate the process of keeping your passwords up to date and things like that? You find those, uh, partially automated numbers at 70% fall down to under 50%. Uh, and you would think that would be like the first thing you would automate if you were going to do it. Uh, and so, I, I have a strong suspicion that we've got a little bit of, uh, you know, grade inflation in that partially automated group. I think they are trying not to say, no, we don't automate anything. 
and they do this instead. <laughs> yeah, I think if we could turn... I, I think that I agree with Tim's point, too, that partially automated is a pretty wide umbrella. <laughs> you know, We have a script that one, runs every once in a while to make sure this particular thing is working. Could be somebody's version of partially automated, uh, but not exactly assessing your cloud security posture for you. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Now, back to your host, Tim Erlen. In terms of categories in the survey itself, we called out identity and access management, root account access, uh, logging, and then under each of those, some specific um, automation options. So, uh, you know, there's there are things that are missing there, obviously that that could be automated or not automated. And if you check any of those boxes, you would you would call yourself partially automated, I suppose. Yeah. During a one user uh, interview, we were talking to someone who was in the the manual. Uh, use case where they were literally had a spreadsheet um, and they were you know logging into their cloud account and working through one at a time and checking to see that things were configured correctly and um, I asked how many accounts they had done that for and I think it was something like 10 uh, over the course of quite a long period of time and that just sounds like uh, a pretty pretty painful way to make sure that things are set up the way they're supposed to be, and it doesn't leave you a lot of room to catch if something changed. <laughs> yeah, the, the the time cycle on uh, on catching changes there would be pretty long. It's true. Yeah, one of the things I think this uh, uh, probably suggests, although it's not very conclusive in the data itself, is that uh, the number of uh, organizations that are not that. Uh, uh, sophisticated in terms of their, uh, uh, you know, basic security is, is, uh, it, it's probably a, f a fairly large number. Um, you know, this, this has shown up in some other conversations. We've, uh, talked to people about, uh, about whether or not they're, uh, uh, verifying their accounts, uh, uh, uh configuration, uh, which is a, a strong indicator of, uh, of the general security and the general sophistication. And, it was surprisingly few companies that uh, uh, were doing that, or at least a lot less than you would think would. Um, and so I am I am concerned that we are moving a lot of people into the cloud space without necessarily having given them appropriate education about how to do it properly, even though the tools are there to do it. One of the things that caught my attention there was how many people are concerned about human error and there should be a natural uh, uh, correlation. The more automation you have, the less human error you're likely to experience. So if they really had 70% deploying a, a, a healthy degree of automation, you know, seeing a 93% still c concerned about human error is inconsistent. What yeah. I really think you're doing there is saying that we're concerned because, well, it's still a risk. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. There, there was a question in there. Neither of you picked it out as an interesting result. Uh, there was a question about um, what best practices frameworks do you follow? Uh, the specific question was, which best practice security frameworks does your organization use for securing public cloud environments? And the two at the top were, number one was NIST at 50%, and the second was the CIS benchmarks for cloud at 46%. Um, and below that, we had DISA, other, and um, we don't use any frameworks. 20% said we don't use any framework for cloud. So, I mean, that, that gives you a, at least a little bit of a sense of where organizations that are paying attention are looking for that kind of guidance. 
I also think that some of the numbers are maybe a little overstated by virtue of, uh, you know, what uh, uh, we were talking about before is that uh, uh, the, the amount of commitment a company has to it. If mm-hmm. one group uh, is responding on behalf of a 5,000 person uh, company, uh, you know, they may be implementing some of these, but is it used across all the business groups? Yeah, or they may be using it for a small portion of their environment for one account for, you know, what they know about. Sure. Exactly. And, yeah. and so, by virtue of that, uh, you know, I would really like to see a lot more people look at uh, uh, some of the questions about what do they need to do in, in their cloud accounts to be secure. So you mean rather than, than just referring to the framework to actually understand what's in that framework and why? Uh, what's in the framework and why, um, what is their inventory, uh, for instance, of, of different cloud accounts across different uh, CSPs, um, and are you, uh, you know, you, you, it's just like the normal, uh, uh, you know, top 20. You've got to know what you, uh, what's out there uh, that you need to be protecting first and then, uh, you know, go through in a rote fashion and, and begin protecting it. And I have a feeling that we're, uh, you know, we're seeing some uh, results that are coming back from the early work that they, you know, a big, a big uh, company is, is doing some isolated, very good work and then a lot of uh, very marginal. And I and I don't yeah. think the marginal stuff is showing up on on the the research as well as it should. Well, yeah, because you're getting the 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 folks who are most interested responding or um, you know providing data, I suppose. Yeah, I, I mean, you you touch on one of my favorite soapbox topics, which is that when you when you move to the cloud or you move assets to the cloud or processes or services, that the the core security controls that are required don't really change. The methods of implementing them and the tools might change, but fundamentally you still need to understand what assets you have, what your inventory is, how those things are configured, how they're changing, how they're vulnerable, and be able to, to take steps to respond and remediate to those those situations. Absolutely. But this also ties into the skills gap question is, you know, if you imagine that what we're doing is we're doing this monolithic shift of the uh, entire uh, uh, workload inventory of the, the country uh, uh, from on-premise into cloud. We've got this workforce that has not had that experience. Uh, it, you know, all the uh, the truly experienced people that live in uh, the on-prem environment don't have that exposure yet, and so we're throwing them in there rather quickly, yeah. uh, and just hoping they'll make do. And I think what we're going to find is it's going to be reflected in the amount of uh, human error that occurs and the amount of, uh, you know, low level. Uh, I, I've got the first uh, certification, but I'm not really that familiar with cloud yet. Uh, that kind of behavior going on. And I think that could go on for maybe 10 years. Yeah, I think you, you touch upon two of uh, you and, and Brent both picked different results that I think touch on that same topic. The one that, that you picked was uh, this question of how concerned are you about human error causing accidental public exposure of your data in a cloud environment? I always love these how concerned are you questions because when you ask information security professionals about how concerned they are, like there's a certain percentage that will always answer yes no matter what you ask. <laughs> but the, the result is 93%, right? So the vast, vast majority of the respondents are, are concerned about human error, um, which goes to that skills gap. And then Brent picked out uh, the question about in your ideal world, how would your organization change the level of enforcement automation? And this was a question that was centered around, do people want more uh, or less automation uh, for security enforcement in their cloud environments? And Brent, what, why did you pick out that one? Uh, part of it that was just kind of interesting to me was the mirror image from, um, you know, how does your company assess your overall cloud security posture? Because 6% of people said that they fully automated that. Um, I'd love to talk to those folks. Uh, but oh. the only uh, per- people who said they don't want to change the level of automation um, when we were asking in your ideal world how would it work is 6%. So Yeah, it's perfect. I'm wondering if that's kind of a, a mirror reflection. Also, um, the 2% of people who don't, assess their cloud security posture at all matched up with the 2% of people who said they want less automation. <laughs> um, so maybe those are the same folks. They're just they're just against it completely. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty good. I see why you picked that out. That's interesting. To fill but out to, the rest of that, it was also a mirror image of 46% 
uh, said they want slightly more, and 46% said they want significantly more automation. So that this is like, you know, as visualized as a pie chart, it's it's um it's nearly perfect, really. Yeah, when we have uh, interviews kind of centered around this type of question, um, it's it's interesting. You know, would you want to automate more? It's a very easy yes because there's just not enough hours in the day, and there's not any way for someone to cram the full amount of expertise he's necessary into their head to just do this by clacking with the keyboard. Um, but there's also this hesitation. It's like, do I want more automation? Yes, of course. But, you know, I need to vet it. It needs to be proven. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, you know, there's a, a security mindset, um, you know, of, of when you've worked in, in information security for a while, you start just sort of constantly thinking about how systems might break. And automation is one of these things that can... In an ideal scenario, it prevents human error. Um, but in many scenarios, it amplifies human error. Because if you have a human error uh, that starts at the beginning of that automation process, it can be amplified to um, everywhere that automation exists as well. So right. I can imagine security professionals looking at that and saying, well, yeah, I like automation, but I also want to make sure that I'm not uh, just amplifying the human error that that naturally exists when you put put people inside of a process. Yeah, I think it's kind of like the are you concerned question. <laughs> if the question was, you know, how much auto how much would you completely trust automation <laughs> to assess your security, we might have gotten drastically lower numbers. Well, and there's a good question, we, you know, we, we probably wouldn't ask it in a survey, but it's a good one. How concerned are you that the automation of security enforcement will cause a breach or problem? You'd probably get a relatively high percentage of yeses from a, a security audience. I think yeah. that's a worthwhile question to ask. <laughs> that's an interesting question. I mean, I, you know, I think about the, um, as we make this transition from traditional on-premise uh, systems to cloud, automation seems to sort of come with it in terms of configuration deployment. On-premise, we've always had folks who say, well, I, I don't really want automated response because I want a human being in the process. I want to create a ticket, I want it to go through my workflow. On the cloud side, because so much of the deployment and configuration is done through automation anyway, we don't see that that uh, that same response to automation. So there there are two different environments at play there. There's one other data point I, I picked up in a conversation one time that I thought also bears on this question, um, and that was uh, a, a customer that said, uh, "I have to move to automation because uh, uh, the the bad guys are automating their attacks, and they're much faster and much too fast for us to respond to, and I will be outclassed if I uh, don't have automation." And so I, I feel like you know, while the 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 problems of do you trust it have to be overcome. Uh, you know, your alternatives are pretty much, well, you'll get beaten if you don't find a way to, to make it trustworthy. That's a fair point. Yeah, you've got to pay attention to that threat landscape and um, adjust your, your defensive posture to, to match what the, the threats are actually doing. I think it's also interesting, um, in, in whatever environment you're trying to secure, there's often, you know, a series of playbooks under this set of circumstances, this is what you do. Um, and the playbook doesn't change. Uh, and if you have a person who's got some expertise around security, who has to, you know, kind of take action and jump in when one of these playbooks needs to be needs to be run, and they take the exact same steps and they move through the same systems, you're kind of taking off the table that security expertise for all the time that they spend, you know, running through these kind of repeated processes. So. I think, um, you know, this, this drive to move towards automation might be a little bit in response to that. Like, you want to have the people there to think through the tough problems and to understand the things that, you know, might happen kind of between the lines of alerts. Um, and for the times where the playbook would be identical every single time a situation arose, you know, that's that's a computer problem. <laughs> Well, you can also think of that as applying the the expertise at the point in the process where it has the biggest benefit. So if uh, extensive automation amplifies human error or not, it can also amplify that expertise um, if you apply it at the beginning of the process. This is also going to loop back to our uh, skills gap question. Um, if we are 2 million plus people short, 
you know, one of the problems that we've got is, is there are unmanned stations and those that are manned are overworked. And so we're going to have a burnout problem, uh, to compound the, uh, uh, the skills gap, uh, problem. So I think people, uh, will be naturally forced into the automation, uh, side of the house, uh, as we go forward in time, unless we are able to, you know, recruit and train a lot of people really fast. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That skills gap challenge is, is sort of ever present and has impacts that, um, that aren't always immediately obvious. Ubiquitous all across the, uh, the problem space. <laughs> True. All right. Well, I think that brings us to the, the end of our time, uh, for this episode, at least. I always love these kinds of surveys because they give us plenty to talk about. The data is always interesting. Um, it, it spurs conversation. Um, hopefully for the folks who are listening, that conversation, uh, that we just had spurs you to go check out the data and have your own conversations. Um, inside your organization with your colleagues. Um, it's uh, interesting results, and we're always happy to to, to chat about them. So um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Brent, for the time. Um, I thought it Thank was a great you. conversation, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the next episode. So I hope you all join us for the next episode of the, the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Brought to you by Tripwire. Visit tripwire.com.